Okay, today is the 8th of August uh, and we come to Majima Nikaya Sutta 47 Vimang Saka Sutta, the Enquirer Thus have I heard On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park There he addressed the monks thus Monks, noble sir, they replied The Blessed One said Monks a monk who is an inquirer, not knowing how to gauge another's mind, should make an investigation of the Tathagata in order to find out whether or not he is fully enlightened. Rebel Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. Have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, monks, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, he's telling the monks lah, that uh, they should make an investigation of the Buddha to find out or not to find out whether or not he is enlightened. Nah. Uh, so the Buddha uh, is a teacher uh, who asked his disciples uh, to question everything. Uh, mm. Monks, a monk who is an inquirer, not knowing how to gauge another's mind, should investigate the Tathagata with respect to two kinds of states. States cognizable through the eye and through the ear thus. Are they found in the Tathagata or not? Any defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? When he, when he investigates him, he comes to know. No defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further thus. Are there found in the Tathagata or not any mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? When he, when he investigates him, he comes to know. No mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further thus. Are they found in the Tathagata or not? Cleansed states cognizable to the eye or to the ear. When he investigates him, he comes to know. Cleansed states cognizable to the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. Stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the Buddha is telling his disciples uh, uh, through, through seeing, uh, I mean seeing the Buddha's actions, uh, or to hearing the Buddha's words, uh, and then uh, they should investigate uh, whether the Buddha uh, has any defiled states or not, uh, uh, and then also whether he has any mixed states. Uh. Mixed states means sometimes defiled, sometimes not defiled, uh, sometimes good, sometimes uh, bad. Uh, uh. And then cleansed states, that means uh, the Buddha has uh, achieve certain uh, cleansed states. Uh, uh, so, through his actions and through the speech, uh, it can be known. When he comes to know this, he, he investigates him further thus. Has this venerable one attained this wholesome state over a long time, or did he attain it recently? When he investigates him, he comes to know. This venerable one has attained this wholesome state over a long time. He did not attain it only recently. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further thus. Has this venerable one acquired renown and attained fame so that the dangers connected with renown and fame are found in him? For monks, as long as a monk has not acquired renown and attained fame, the dangers connected with renown and fame are not found in him. But when he has acquired renown and attained fame, those dangers are found in him. When he investigates him, he comes to know. This venerable one has acquired renown and attained fame, but the dangers connected with renown and fame are not found in him. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that they should uh, consider whether the Buddha has attained these wholesome states uh, for a long time or only recently. Uh. And also uh, whether uh, he has uh, a name and fame uh, and whether those dangers connected with name and fame uh, 
fame uh, are found in him. Uh, those dangers connected with name and fame uh, mainly is uh, arro- uh, this uh, ego. Uh, because of the ego, uh, uh, there is arrogance. Uh, and also because of the ego, uh, because of arrogance, uh, sometimes uh, a person can have a lot of anger. Uh, and also, if he's greedy, whether he's greedy or not, uh, because uh, once uh, a person wants name, uh, then he's greedy for fame, he's greedy for this and that, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, as far as the Buddha is concerned, uh, he does not have these dangers uh, connected with renown and fame. Uh. There is a Sangyutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya called Laba Sakra, where the Buddha said uh, that a monk uh, should avoid uh, uh, gains and fame. Uh, should, should not be greedy uh, for gains means offerings uh, and fame, uh, uh, having a uh, 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 name la, uh, becoming famous la, uh. so the Buddha said uh, these two are very dangerous la. sometimes a monk uh, before he has attained fame uh, uh, he's practicing well but very often after he becomes famous uh, then as his ego uh, becomes um, swollen and uh, he will uh, go the wrong way la. When he comes to know this, he investigates him further thus. Is this Venerable One restrained without fear, not restrained by fear? And does he avoid indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust through the destruction of lust? When he investigates him, he comes to know this Venerable One is restrained without fear, not restrained by fear. And he, invo- and he avoids indulging in sensual pleasure because he is without lust through the destruction of lust. Now monks, if others should ask that monk thus, what are the Venerable One's reasons and what is his evidence? Whereby he says, that Venerable One is restrained without fear, not restrained by fear, and he avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust through the destruction of lust. Answering rightly, that monk would answer thus, whether that Venerable One dwells in the Sangha or alone, while some there are well behaved and some are ill behaved, and some there teach a group, while some here are seen concerned about material things, and some are unsullied by material things. Still, that Venerable One does not despise anyone because of that. And I have heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. I am restrained without fear, not restrained by fear. And I avoid indulging in sensual pleasures, because I am without lust, through the destruction of lust. Um, stop here for a moment. Huh? So here is quite interesting. The Buddha says uh, that um, that a monk uh, who is restrained uh, without fear uh, uh, and he avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, that monk, uh, when he sees well-behaved and ill-behaved monks, uh, Still, uh, he does not despise anyone uh, because of that. Uh, so, in other words, uh, this, this, this person, uh, uh, he has let go. Uh, and also, his ego is not so uh, big. Uh. Normally, when we are new on the spiritual path, uh, we are very um, diligent uh, to practice well. Uh. And uh, when we are diligent to practice well and we see others uh, not practicing well, uh, we tend to look down on them. Uh, But uh, when we are more mature, uh, spiritually more mature, uh, then um, we, even though we progress on the spiritual path, uh, the Buddha says, uh, we don't identify ourselves uh, uh, with that, uh, with that progress, uh, you don't think uh, I am, I am, I am, I am, uh, I am uh, uh, very clean in my precepts, or my meditation is very good, and all this thing. Uh, if you understand the Dhamma uh, later, you see uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, the Buddha does not uh, identify himself uh, with uh, all those uh, good states uh, because the. 
has let go of the ego. Uh, so this is quite, quite, uh, quite revealing uh, that uh, if a monk uh, he progresses, uh, then uh, he will not um, differentiate so much. Uh, he will not um, be critical of even ill-behaved monks. Uh, uh. The, tathag- the, tathag- the Tathagata monks should be questioned further about that thus. Are they found in the Tathagata or not? Any defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? The Tathagata would answer thus. No defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are they found in the Tathagata or not? Any mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? The Tathagata would answer thus, no mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are they found in the Tathagata or not? Cleansed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear. The Tathagata would answer thus, cleansed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. They are my pathway and my domain, yet I do not identify with them. Uh, stop it for a moment. So here, this is what I was trying to say, lah, that the Buddha, he has uh, cleansed states, huh? he has made a lot of progress, huh? but he does not identify the self huh? with, with all that uh, cleansed states, huh? or he does not think, uh, I have attained this, I have attained that. Lah. Uh-huh. Monks, a disciple should approach the teacher who speaks thus in order to hear the Dhamma. The teacher teaches him the Dhamma with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the teacher teaches the Dhamma to a monk in this way, through direct knowledge of a certain teaching here in that Dhamma, the monk comes to a conclusion about the teachings. He places confidence in the teacher thus. The Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Now, if others should ask that monk thus, what are the Venerable One's reasons and what is his evidence, whereby he says, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way, answering rightly, that monk would answer thus, here, friends, I approach the Blessed One in order to hear the Dhamma. The Blessed One taught me the Dhamma with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the Blessed One taught the Dhamma to me in this way, through direct knowledge of a certain teaching here in that Dhamma, I came to a conclusion about the teachings. I place confidence in the teacher thus. The Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha is practicing the good way. Monks, when anyone's faith has been planted, rooted, and established in the Tathagata through these reasons, terms, and phrases, his faith is said to be supported by reasons, rooted in vision, firm. It is invincible by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. That is how, monks, there is an investigation of the Tathagata in accordance with the Dhamma. And that is how the Tathagata is well investigated in accordance with the Dhamma. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So here this Sutta is telling us uh, that we should question everything, even the state of the teacher, uh, like uh, the Buddha uh, taught the Kalama Sutta, where the Buddha says, uh, don't believe. uh, because, because uh, uh, the teacher has a good reputation, don't believe because it comes from the books, everything, uh, but investigate. Uh. So the other thing uh, interesting about this uh, sutta is that uh, if a monk is practicing correctly, uh, even if he acquires renown and attained fame, then uh, he is not moved by it, uh, he doesn't become arrogant. Uh, the ego doesn't become so big, nah? not so greedy. Nah? Another thing is, um, if a monk uh, progress, as a monk progresses, nah, then um, he becomes less critical of others. Nah? Uh, he's more compassionate of other people's behavior, nah? and uh, he's uh, more um, keen nah, to improve himself nah? instead of. Uh, 
criticizing others lah. Hmm. Okay, now we come to another sutta, sutta 48, nah, which is a very important sutta lah, towards the end, nah, you will see. Lah. 48, Kosambia sutta, the Kosambians. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Kosambi in Gosita's Park. Now on that occasion the monks at Kosambi were taken to quarreling and brawling and were deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. They could neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. They could neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Then a certain monk went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and informed him of what was happening. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come monk, tell those monks in my name that the teacher calls them. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied. And he went to those monks and told them, The teacher calls the Venerable Ones. Yes, friend, they replied. And they went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked them, Monks, is it true that you have taken to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others? that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, what do you think? When you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, do you on that occasion maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech and mind, in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life? No, Venerable Sir. <coughs> So, monks, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, on that occasion you do not maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life. Misguided men, what can you possibly know, what can you see that you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes? stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Misguided men, that will, be, that will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Let's stop here for a moment. So, uh, whenever uh, two persons quarrel uh, or several people quarrel, uh, um, it doesn't really matter who is right, who is wrong. Uh, but um, if we practice the Buddha's teachings, uh, then we don't uh, continue to quarrel. Uh, at least we try to avoid each other. And uh, uh, if you can't uh, practice metta, uh, at least avoid each other. Uh. So uh, if, if, if people quarrel, uh, uh, both sides are to be blamed. Uh. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, there are these six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. What are the six? Here, a monk maintains bodily acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. Again, a monk maintains verbal acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to unity. Again, <clears throat> A monk maintains mental acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to unity. Again, a monk uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life. Without making reservations, he shares with them any gain of a kind that accords with the Dhamma and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the contents of his bowl. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to unity. Again, 
a monk dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmortal, liberating, commended by the wise, not misapprehended and conducive to concentration. This too is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to unity. Again, a monk dwells in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life that view that is noble and emancipating and leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. This too is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. These are the six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. Of these memorable qualities, the highest, the most comprehensive, the most conclusive is this view that is noble and emancipating and leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. Just as the highest, the most comprehensive, the most conclusive part of a pinnacle building is the pinnacle itself, so too of these six memorable qualities, the highest is this view that is noble and emancipating. Stop here for a moment. So these six qualities, when we live together, we should always remember to maintain loving kindness, acts of loving kindness, whether in public or in private, uh, through the body, through the speech, and through the mind towards each other. Uh, uh, if we can't do that, uh, the only obstacle is the ego. Uh, every time we cannot tolerate something, uh, it's the ego uh, surfacing. Uh, and then number four, uh, we are not stingy. Uh, we share with each other uh, what we have. Uh, and then number five uh, is to keep our moral conduct, keep our sila, moral conduct. And number six, the most important is to have right view. When you have Aryan view or right view, then you would see that this body and this self is not I, is not mine. And then your ego won't be so big. So you can um, let go of a lot of things. La. So having right view is very helpful, uh, the most important. And how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering? Here a monk, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, considers thus, is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so possess my mind that I cannot know or see things as they actually are? If a monk is obsessed by sensual lust, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by ill will, then his mind is obsessed. If, is, if he is obsessed by sloth and torpor, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by restlessness and remorse, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by doubt, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about this world, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about the other world, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk takes to quarreling and brawling and is deep in disputes, stabbing others with verbal daggers, then his mind is obsessed. He understands thus, there is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so possess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. I'll stop here for a moment. Now, now this part, now we are coming to this part of the sutta, which is very important. Here, uh, the Buddha is going to talk about seven factors uh, uh, or seven possessions uh, of a sotapanna. Uh, uh, of a sotapanna. So if you think you might be a sotapanna, you, you, you can judge here la, uh, whether you have the qualities. La. So this first one, uh, a monk, uh, he must get rid of the five hindrances. La. What is called obsessions here. La. Uh, he must abandon these five hindrances. La. Because uh, it says here, uh, my mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. If you don't abandon the five hindrances, uh, then your mind is not well disposed la, for awakening. La. Uh, 
So abandoning of the five hindrances uh, is uh, uh, is necessary uh, so that we can uh, see clearly uh, things as they really are. Uh, the minimum that is needed uh, to abandon the five hindrances uh, is what later books call upachara samadhi, uh, a threshold concentration uh, uh, which is very close to the first jhana. Just before a person attains the first jhana, in the suttas uh, it says that the five hindrances are abandoned and abandoned uh, quite permanently. Uh, so you need some samadhi uh, to uh, get rid of the five hindrances. Uh, there are some people, uh, they already have this quality uh, from previous life. Uh, if not, uh, then we have to cultivate uh, this samadhi in this lifetime uh, so that uh, uh, we can attain this utapanna. Uh. <coughs> Second one, uh, again, a noble disciple considers thus, when I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, do I obtain internal serenity? Do I personally obtain stillness? He understands thus, when I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I obtain internal serenity. I personally obtain stillness. This is the second knowledge attained by him. That is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. Ah, so this uh, is another quality uh, that uh, is uh, noble, uh, supramundane, uh, not shared by ordinary putujana, uh, ordinary uh, people uh, who are not Aryans. Uh, uh, so an Aryan uh, will be able to obtain serenity of mind, uh, stillness of mind. The third one, uh, again, a noble disciple considers thus, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? He understands thus, there is no other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh, so here, uh, uh, he knows uh, only in the Buddha's original teachings, uh, by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, then only uh, we can get this uh, uh, right view of an Aryan uh, and be an Aryan. Uh, nowadays, there are some monks uh, who say that all the religions are the same and uh, uh, that uh, other religions also have enlightened people. Uh, this is not what the Buddha says. Uh, the Buddha says uh, only in his teachings. Uh, when you say only in his teachings, it means uh, only basically uh, if you practice the four noble truths, uh, which includes the four in the, the, the this uh, uh, noble eightfold path, uh, and then only uh, you can attain this Aryan uh, Aryan view. Uh, number four. Again, the noble disciple considers thus: Do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a, possess of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offence for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down, still he at once confesses, reveals and discloses it to the teacher or to wise companions in the holy life. And having done that, he enters upon restraint for the future. Just as a young, tender infant lying prone on at once draws back when he puts his hand or his foot on a live coal. So too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. He understands thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fourth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. Uh, one of the necessary conditions uh, of a good disciple uh, is that he has to be straightforward to the teacher. Uh, he should not hide uh, his uh, weaknesses, he should not hide his faults. Uh, uh. So here uh, it is stated uh, that uh, even this, uh, this noble disciple, uh, this Aryan disciple, uh, uh, is capable uh, of committing some uh, kind of offense, uh, some uh, uh, light offense. Uh. Is, although an Aryan is supposed to have perfect sila, uh, he is still uh, sometimes can um, break certain precepts, uh, but not the major precepts. La. But then uh, he does not hide it. La. He, he immediately confesses it, uh, reveals it either to the teacher 
or to his uh, companions in the holy life. Uh. So if a person wants to progress as a disciple, uh, he has to be very forthright, uh, very uh, straightforward to the teacher uh, and reveal everything uh, so that the teacher can correct his faults, uh, not, not, not be very secretive. Uh. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life, yet he has a keen regard for training in the higher virtue, training in the higher mind, and training in the higher wisdom. Just as a cow with a new calf, while she grazes, watches her calf, so too that is the character of a person who possesses right view. He understands thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fifth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha means uh, that uh, a monk uh, may be very busy uh, um, teaching the Dhamma or doing matters for the Sangha, but uh, <coughs> if an Aryan, if an Aryan, uh, then uh, he will still uh, <coughs> uh, be very careful uh, about his uh, uh, sila, his samadhi, and wisdom. Uh, that means uh, he will still uh, uh, keep his precepts very well and train in uh, meditation uh, and also study the sutta uh, for the higher wisdom. Uh. <coughs> Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma Vinaya, proclaimed by the Tathagata, <coughs> is being taught, he heeds it, gives it attention, engages it with all his mind, hears the Dhamma as with eager ears. <coughs> He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. So here, uh, another characteristic uh, of an Aryan disciple, uh, when the Dhamma Vinaya of the Buddha is taught, uh, he is very eager to listen, uh, pay attention uh, with all his mind. So you all should know, uh, whenever there's a Dhamma talk, going on. Uh, don't go and chatter and chatter. I see some of you, uh, uh, when the Dhamma talk is going on, uh, you're talking very loudly. Uh, uh, and you have no interest in the Dhamma. That shows uh, you're really interested in the Dhamma. Uh, any talk, uh, you will pay attention. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma Vinaya proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So this last part, uh, uh, when the Dhamma is taught, uh, this person uh, is extremely happy uh, to hear the Dhamma and is inspired by the Dhamma. That shows what we say, u yen, u yen, king. Uh, he has this affinity with the Dhamma. Uh, so these are the seven uh, qualities uh, of a sutta panna. Uh, uh, so, if you think you might be a Sotapanna, uh, you look at these seven qualities and judge whether you have. Uh, the first one is to be rid of the five hindrances. Uh, you have, uh, uh, and then the second one is uh, you have attained some serenity of mind, uh, stillness of mind. Uh. The third one is that you understand uh, that outside the Buddha's teachings, uh, there cannot be any Aryans. Uh, Number four, 
um, this uh, Sutapanna, he may commit some light offense, lah, but he will immediately uh, confess and reveal it uh, either to his companions uh, in the holy life or to the teacher. Lah. And number five, uh, um, uh, the monk uh, may be very busy uh, uh, doing a lot of Dhamma Dutta work, etc., or maintenance work, or all the duties uh, uh, for the Sangha, yet uh, he still trains. Uh, in sila samadhi and panya lah, moral conduct, concentration and wisdom lah. Then number six, uh, um, when the dhamma vinaya is taught, uh, he pays uh, full attention. Uh, he engages with all his uh, engages it with all his mind. Uh, hears the dhamma with eager ears, uh, very happy and uh, very very eager to hear the dhamma. And then number seven. Uh, when he hears the Dhamma, he's inspired by the Dhamma and gladness uh, is born uh, against gladness connected with the Dhamma. Uh, so these are the seven factors, uh, 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 the characteristics uh, of a Sotapanna. Uh, so this is a very important Sutta. Mm. Now we come to Sutta 49, Brahma Nimantika Sutta, the invitation of a Brahma. This word Niman, Nimantanika, Nimantanika, Brahma Nimantanika. This Nimantanika, just like a lot of Pali words, uh, has crept into the Thai vocabulary. Uh, so the Thai word for invitation uh, is Nimun. Uh, so here from the Niman. Nimanta Nika. So that Niman has become Nimun in uh, Thailand. So whenever you um, uh, in Thailand, they invite each other, they say Nimun. Mm -hmm. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaita's Grove, another Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, on one occasion I was living at Ukata, in the Subhaga grove at the root of a royal sala tree. Now on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in Baka the Brahma thus. This is permanent, this is everlasting, this is eternal, this is total, this is not subject to pass away. For this neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And beyond this, there is no escape. I stop here for a moment. So here this Baka Brahma, he thinks that his world is permanent and everlasting uh, because he has such a long lifespan uh, that he has been there for so long, uh, as long as he can remember. And he doesn't see uh, that he is getting any older uh, because uh, devas, uh, they don't see the body uh, growing old. Uh, so he, he, he thought uh, that uh, uh, he, he is permanent. Uh, and the Buddha said, I knew with my mind the thought in the mind of Baka the Brahma. So just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flex arm, or flex his extended arm, I vanished from the root of the royal sala tree in the Subhaga grove at Ukata and appeared in the Brahma world. Baka the Brahma saw me coming in the distance and said, Come, good sir, welcome, good sir. It is long, good sir, since you found an opportunity to come here. Now, good sir, this is permanent, this is everlasting, this is eternal, this is total, this is not subject to pass away. For this neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears, and beyond this there is no escape. When this was said, I told Baka the Brahma, the worthy Baka the Brahma has lapsed into ignorance. He has lapsed into ignorance in that he says of the impermanent that it is, that it is permanent, of the transient that it is everlasting, of the non-eternal that it is eternal, of the incomplete that it is total, of what is subject to pass away, that it is not subject to pass away. Of what is born, ages, dies, passes away and reappears. That it neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And when there is, there is an escape beyond this, he says that there is no escape beyond this. Then Mara, the evil one, took possession of a member of the Brahma's assembly. And he told me, Mang, Mang, do not 
disbelieve him. Do not disbelieve him. For this Brahma is the great Brahma, the overlord, the untranscended of infallible vision, wielder of mastery, lord, maker and creator, most high providence, master and father of those that are and ever can be. There is some <coughs> other sutta uh, that says uh, this uh, Mahabrahma, this uh, uh, great Brahma, he has been there for so long uh, and for some time he was alone. Uh, then he was thinking to himself, uh, it would be good uh, if I had some friends or uh, some company. Then after some time, uh, some other beings were reborn in that heaven. And when he saw these beings uh, being reborn in the heaven, uh, he thought uh, because of his wish uh, that these beings uh, are born. So because of that, uh, he, he thought, uh, since he's the first in that heaven, uh, he thought there's no other heavens because he does not know of other heavens. So he... He thought, uh, as far as he knows, he's the highest heaven. Uh, and he, so he thought that he was God, uh, that he's the creator. As soon as he thought, he wants some company, and there they appear. Uh, uh. And Mara continued, uh, Before your time, monk, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world who condemn earth through disgust with earth, who condemn water through disgust with water, who condemn fire through disgust with fire, who condemn earth through disgust with who condemn air through disgust with air, who condemn beings through disgust with beings, who condemn gods through disgust with gods, who condemn Pajapati through disgust with Pajapati, who condemn Brahma through disgust with Brahma. And on the dissolution of the body, when the life was cut off, they became established in an inferior body. Before your time, monk, there were also recluses and Brahmins in the world who lauded earth through delight in earth, who lauded water through delight in water, who lauded fire through delight in fire, who lauded air through delight in air, who lauded beings through delight in beings, who lauded gods through delight in gods, who lauded Pajapati through delight in Pajapati, who lauded Brahma through delight in Brahma. And on the dissolution of the body, when the life was cut off, they became established in a superior body. So, monk, I tell you this, be sure, good sir, to do only as the Brahma says. Never overstep the word of the Brahma. If you overstep the word of the Brahma, monk, then like a man trying to deflect an approaching beam of light with a stick, or like a man losing his hold on the earth with his hands and feet as he slips into a deep chasm, so it will befall you, monk. Be sure, good sir, do not do to do only as the Brahma says. Never overstep the word of the Brahma. Do you not see the Brahma's assembly seated here, monk? And Mara, the evil one, thus called to witness the Brahma's assembly. Stop here for a moment. So you see here, this uh, uh, Mara is supposed in, to be uh, residing uh, in the highest of the six sensual uh, realm uh, heavens uh, so actually he he he's in a heaven uh, lower than the brahma gods uh, but he's so powerful uh, that he can take possession of one of the brahma gods uh, and speak to the buddha uh. also what he was trying to say was uh, in the past uh, there were some recluses uh, who condemn the earth, water, fire, wind. Uh, these are the four elements uh, signifying matter, uh, physical matter, uh, and also uh, condemn beings and all that, uh, uh, and even the devas. Uh. What does it mean by condemning? Uh, that means uh, these recluses, uh, they say uh, that everything in the world uh, is impermanent, a source of suffering, uh, and not self. Uh, and because of that, uh, they do not attach to anything in the world and tell others also not to attach to anything in the world. So here he says, uh, they condemn everything in the world. Uh, so he's saying, whereas those uh, who um, did not condemn everything in the world, then they had a good rebirth. When this was said, I told Mara, the evil one, I know you, evil one. Do not think he does not know me. You are Mara, evil one and the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly, and the members of the Brahma's assembly have all fallen into your hands. They have all fallen into your power. You, evil one, think, this one too has fallen into my hands. He too has fallen into my power. But I have not fallen into your hands, evil one. 
I have not fallen into your power. When this was said, Baka the Brahma told me, Good sir, I say of the permanent that it is permanent, of the everlasting that it is everlasting, of the eternal that it is eternal, of the total that it is total, of what is not subject to pass away that it is not subject to pass away, of what neither is born nor ages nor dies, nor passes away nor reappears that it is neither born nor ages nor dies nor passes away nor reappears and when there is no escape beyond this I say that there is no escape beyond this before your time monk there were recluses and brahmins in the world whose asceticism lasted as long as your whole life they knew when there is no then when there is an escape beyond that there is an escape beyond and when there is no escape beyond that there is no escape beyond so monk I tell you this you will find no escape beyond and eventually you will reap only weariness and disappointment. If you were whole to earth, you will be close to me within my domain for me to work my will upon and punish. If you hold to water, to fire, to air, to beings, to gods, to Pajapati, to Brahma, you will be close to me within my domain for me to work my will upon and punish. And the Buddha said, I know that too, Brahma. If I will hold to earth, I shall be close to you within your domain for you to work your will upon and punish. If I will hold to water, to fire, to air, to beings, to gods, to Pajapati, to Brahma, I shall be close to you within your domain for you to work your will upon and punish. Further, I understand your reach and your sway to extend thus. Baka the Brahma has this much power, this much might, this much influence. And the Baka asked, Now, good sir, how far do you understand my reach and my sway to extend? And the Buddha said, As far as moon and sun revolve, shining and lighting up the quarters, over a thousandfold such world does your sovereignty extend. And there you know the high and low, and those with lust and free from lust, the state that is thus and otherwise, the coming and going of beings. Brahma, I understand your reach and your sway to extend thus. Baka, the Brahma, has this much power, this much might, this much influence. But Brahma, there are three other bodies which you neither know nor see, and which I know and see. There is the body called the gods of streaming radiance, from which you passed away and reappeared here. Because you have dwelt here long, your memory of that has lapsed, and hence you do not know or see it, but I know and see it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I, moan, I know more than you. There is a body called the gods of refulgent glory. There is a body called the gods of great fruit. You do not know or see that, but I know and see it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I, moan, I know more than you. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha is telling uh, this Brahma that uh, he knows more than Brahma. Brahma has forgotten that he previously was in a higher heaven and passing away from there, he appeared in this Brahma world. So the Buddha told him that there is this Brahma world is actually the world of the first jhana. And the Buddha is telling him uh, this world of the, the gods of streaming radiance are in the in the realm of the second jhana and then the gods of refulgent glory are in the third jhana and then the gods of great fruit vihapala are in the fourth jhana so the buddha can see all this and he this brahma does not brahma having directly known earth as earth and having directly known that which is not commensurate with the earthness of earth i do not claim to be earth i did not claim to be in earth i did not claim to be apart from earth i did not claim earth to be mine i did not affirm earth thus brahma in regard to direct knowledge i do not stand merely at the same level as you how then could i know less rather i know more than you Brahma, having directly known water as water, fire as fire, air as air, beings as beings, gods as gods, Pajapati as Pajapati, Brahma as Brahma, the gods of streaming radiance as the gods of streaming radiance, the gods of refulgent glory as the gods of refulgent glory, the gods of great fruit as the gods of great fruit, the overlord as the overlord, as 
all as all and having directly known that which, which is not commensurate with the allness of all. I did not claim to be all. I did not claim to be in all. I did not claim to be apart from all. I did not claim all to be mine. I did not affirm all. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. Uh, stop here for a moment. moment. So here, what the Buddha is saying uh, is uh, similar to what is found in the first sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, where the Buddha says uh, that he, uh, having known uh, earth, uh, uh, he, does, he does not claim to be earth, does not claim to be in earth, does not claim to be apart from earth, uh, does not claim earth to be mine, uh, etc. Uh, so you have to look at the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 1 uh, to understand this part. Uh. Now, now, so Brahma asks, Good sir, if you claim to directly know that which is not commensurate with the allness of all, may your claim not turn out to be vain and empty. And the Buddha said, The consciousness that makes no showing, nor has to do with finiteness, not claiming being with respect to all, that is not commensurate with the earthness of earth, that is not commensurate with the waterness of water, that is not commensurate with the allness of all. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, three lines, uh, the consciousness that makes no showing, uh, nor has to do with finiteness, uh, not claiming being with respect to all this. Uh, uh, there is more of it uh, in the Diga Nikaya Sutta number 11 called the Kevada Sutta. Uh, this, uh, the Buddha is talking about the state of Nibbana. Uh, uh, where the Buddha says uh, that uh, the Nibbana is a state uh, where the six consciousnesses uh, have stopped. Uh. But even though the six consciousnesses, uh, the six sense, the six sense consciousness has stopped, um, there is another type of consciousness uh, uh, which is infinite. Uh, and uh, here it says, it makes no showing because it has no object. Uh. Unlike the consciousness of uh, the, the six consciousnesses, uh, the six sense consciousnesses, uh, whenever it arises, uh, there must be an object. Uh, but with the consciousness of Nibbana, there is no object. Uh, because there is no object, uh, there is no self. Uh, uh, so this uh, part uh, about this uh, uh, Nibbana being with the consciousness, uh, some monks uh, who follow the Abhidharma, they cannot accept. Uh, uh, because uh, um, they, they cannot accept this. Uh, so, but in the sutta we see uh, that this is what the Buddha says. Uh, and then the Brahma said, Good sir, I shall vanish from you. And the Buddha said, Vanish from me if you can, Brahma. Then Baka the Brahma saying, I shall vanish from the recluse Gautama. I shall vanish from the recluse Gautama. Was unable to vanish. Thereupon I said, Brahma, I shall vanish from you. And he said, Vanish from me if you can, good sir. Then I performed such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly and the members of the Brahma's assembly could hear my voice but could not see me. After I had vanished, I uttered this stanza. Having seen fear in every mode of being and in being seeking for non-being, I did not affirm any mode of being, nor did I cling to any delight in being. At that, the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly and the members of the Brahma's assembly were struck with wonder and amazement, saying, It is wonderful, sirs, it is marvellous, the great power and great might of the recluse Gotama. We have never before seen or heard of any other recluse or Brahmin who had such great power and such great might as has this recluse Gotama, who went forth from a Sakin clan. Sirs, though living in a generation that delights in being, that takes delight in being, that rejoices in being, he has extirpated being together with its root. These devas, uh, they judge each other, uh, how great each other is, uh, through two things. Uh. One is the, the light. Uh, the light, uh, all the devas, they emit light. Uh. So, if a, if a deva is more bright than others, uh, then he's considered to have more power. The other one is the psychic power. Uh. Psychic power. So here, this Mahabrahma, he has great psychic power. So he told the Buddha he's going to vanish away from the Buddha. But because the Buddha's 
psychic power was greater, uh, the Buddha control his mind. Uh, so that he said, uh, I'm vanishing, I'm vanishing, but he could not vanish from the Buddha. <laughs> and then the Buddha challenged him, uh, the Buddha said, I will vanish from you. Uh, then he said, you go ahead. Uh, and then the Buddha immediately vanished, uh, and all the devas could not see the Buddha, but could hear his voice. Uh. So they were, they were amazed, uh, they had never seen a human being uh, with such great power. Uh. Then Mara, the evil one, took possession of a member of the Brahma's assembly, and he said to me, Good sir, if that is what you know, if that is what you have discovered, do not guide your lay disciples or those gone forth. Do not teach the Dhamma to your lay disciples or to those gone forth. Create no yearning in your lay disciples or in those gone forth. Before your time, monk, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world claiming to be Arahant, Samasambuddha. And they guided their lay disciples and those gone forth. They taught the Dhamma to their lay disciples and to those gone forth. They created yearning in their lay disciples and in those gone forth. And on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in an inferior body. Before your time, monk, there were also recluses and Brahmins in the world, claiming to be Arahant and Samasambuddha. And they did not guide the lay disciples or those gone forth. They did not teach the Dhamma to the lay disciples or those gone forth. They created no yearning in the lay disciples or in those gone forth. And on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in a superior body. So, Mang, I tell you this, be sure, good sir, to abide inactive, devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. This is better left undeclared. And so, good sir, inform no one else. When this was said, I told Mara, the evil one, I know you, evil one. Do not think he does not know me. You are Mara, evil one. It is not out of compassion for their welfare that you speak thus. It is without compassion for their welfare that you speak thus. You think thus, evil one. Those to whom the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma will escape from my sphere. Those recluses and Brahmin of yours evil one, who claimed to be Arahan Samasambuddha, were not Arahan Samasambuddha, but I, who claim to be Arahan and Samasambuddha, am Arahan and Samasambuddha. If the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma to disciples, he is such evil one. This word such, huh? uh, the Pali word is Tadiso, huh? you can say thus. Huh? Sometimes they trans translate as thus. If the Tathagata teaches the disciple to disciples, he is such evil one. And if the Tathagata does not teach the Dhamma to disciples, he is such. If the Tathagata guides disciples, he is such evil one. And if the Tathagata does not guide disciples, he is such. Why is that? Because the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree whose crown is cut off is incapable of further growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Thus, because Mara was unable to reply and because it began with the Ma Brahma's invitation, this discourse is entitled On the Invitation of a Brahma. Uh, that's the end of the Sutta. Uh, so, this Sutta is one of those uh, concerning the Maha Brahma. Uh, and the Buddha went to him, uh, be, uh, firstly, because he had wrong view, and secondly, uh, usually, uh, because he has some affinity with the Buddha from the past life. Usually, uh, the Buddha goes to such uh, devas uh, because they were his teachers before uh, in the past life. So he feels that, that he owes some um, gratitude to them uh, to help them uh, to get right view. Uh, so he, he goes to such uh, beings. Uh. So you, you see from this sutta also uh, the power of Brahma, how he can enter even the, the Brahma uh, uh, some of the Brahma Devas bodies uh, and speak to to the Buddha. That means he possess, he control their mind. Um, so we stop here. Anything to discuss?
pas seperti compare to compare the you can regret that um, for a man to forty eight eh? oh uh sita forty seven paragraph ten <coughs> Where a monk is restrained here, he does not he dwells in the sangha all alone. He does not judge others. There are other monks who are unskilled, but this particular monk who practices well, he doesn't judge them. Yes, yes. So um, we also read in earlier sutras that the asavas are makers of measurement. So for a monk or practitioner to abandon the the I am superior, inferior, or equal that kind of view, this uh, would like Dante to please explain for a sort of uh, different stages of enlightenment. How would this, how would this be? observe from the behavior of um, it's not exactly uh, that the monk does not judge others la. here it says uh, that the verbal one does not despise anyone uh, so it's not that he does not judge la. he can judge but uh, he does not despise la, because uh, he has compassion la. he knows that all of us uh, we are on this spiritual path uh, and we are at different levels la, different levels uh, uh, and so he, he because of that he does not despise uh, someone uh, who is less than him la. but then um, the other the thing about the um, not uh, thinking uh, others are superior or inferior or equal to him uh, i guess that is when a person has uh, cut off this identity view. La. When you have the identity view, uh, you identify yourself with this body and this mind. La. So when you uh, have cut off this identity view, uh, then you don't identify yourself with this body and, and this mind. Then even you progress also, you don't think I progress. If you attain something also, you don't think I attain. La. I just said uh, uh, this attainment is there. La. Uh, so that's why, like the Buddha said, uh, uh, Clan states cognizable through the eye or ear are found in the Tathagata. They are my pathway and my domain, yet I do not identify with them. Yeah, Dante, this, this, the Buddha is describing himself. So yeah. I was thinking, um, comparing to a Sotapan who has uh, set aside this, the Sakaya Diki, yes. I mean, it, it would be very much different compared to the Buddha the Arahan. Yeah. Uh, in this sense, uh, probably not that different uh, because uh, uh, once a person, I guess, has uh, cut Sakaya Diti, uh, uh, if he, although he still has the self, uh, and uh, he from there, um, if he does not identify himself with the body and the mind, uh, then he would not uh, compare others with himself. La. And also he would have compassion uh, for beings. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, even in the Buddha, uh, you see uh, sometimes when certain monks behave uh, wrongly, uh, he call them fool, foolish men. Uh, I do this and all that. Uh, so uh, so the, the point here is that uh, that uh, 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 this uh, this this person, this Arya, he will not despise anyone. Uh, it's not that he, he sees everybody is the same. Not really, lah. Mm. Yes, we look at the, the behavior of Mahakasapa. He can be very very harsh. Yeah. That's how compassion Ananda in the case of Mahakasapa, I think his character, after so many uh, lifetimes, uh, is ingrained. We all have certain uh, uh, 
uh, characteristics uh, which uh, differentiate us. Lah. So, uh, even though he has uh, become an arahan, his, this character is so strong uh, that uh, out of habit, lah, I guess, uh, he's, he has this tendency to be very rough with people. Lah. Uh, so, also we find in the, um, among the arahans, uh, there was one uh, who used to address other monks uh, like a low caste like that. Uh. And then uh, it seems that he has been a, a high caste person for many, many lifetimes. Uh. So he's, 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 he's become, he has, he's, 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 he's a habit, uh, he has not shaken off. Uh. So he keeps addressing others as like low caste people like that. Uh. Uh, so even though he's, he does not have the self, uh, already arahan. Uh, so in that respect, uh, that's why I said, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a sotapanna or it's a arahana, I think that behavior uh, is, is, is more of habit. Mm. Yes, uh, there's another question that they, which relates to uh, community living. This is one, I think you're not mistaken, Ananda was complaining about um, uh, arahan Anuruddha traveling with Kimbila uh, and uh, monks like uh, uh, Nandiya. And uh, they did not attend to their disciples. And Ananda was complaining to the Buddha that uh, they didn't look after their disciples, or nobody is teaching the disciples. And the Buddha with, um, sort of admonished Ananda, he, he should not say that. In fact, he should take over training the, the Anuruddha's group's uh, disciples. So I was thinking that he, he, he is already a Sotapan. So I mean, that. that those who shows that he, he still have, um, what shall I say, that um, critical of others? I don't exactly remember it the way you remember it, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, in this case, uh, uh, it is because you can see our uh, compassion uh, for those disciples. Uh, uh, he feels that uh, somebody should teach them. Lah. That's why he, he brought it up, I guess. The uh, Buddha got enlightenment. He wanted to uh, seek out his two previous masters to share this uh, knowledge that he had attained to them. But he found, he found that they passed away. And probably they are in the very higher rank. Uh, that's out of university. The Buddha help them with this knowledge so that they can, they can possibly get to Nibbana? No, the Buddha could not help them because they, have, they were reborn in a very high level. And um, there is a sutta where remember Ananda asked the Buddha, is it true, Bhagawa, that this flesh body, eh, you can fly to heaven with this flesh body, and the Buddha said yes. The Buddha said uh, when he meditates, uh, then the mind is very strong, and then the body feels very light. Uh, and then he just wills it, uh, and he takes off uh, <laughs> like a rocket. Uh, and then uh, the Buddha mentioned uh, that this flesh body can go as far as the Brahma heavens. That's the maximum uh, the flesh body can go to. Uh, so because of that, uh, he could not reach the... Uh, the Arupa heavens are uh, where his former teachers were, uh, so he could not teach them. Uh, yeah. uh, the Buddha says, uh, the, you remember just now you read that, that section, uh, the Buddha says whether he teaches the Dhamma or he does not teach the Dhamma, he's always thus, he's always such. Uh, he the, he has lost the self lah. So the 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 the, the Buddha is unmoved. Uh, he cannot be moved lah. But uh, uh, that is why you can understand uh, why Pachika Buddhas uh, after they become light, enlightened, they don't think uh, I have to teach my former teacher or my former mother or my former father and all that. Uh, no no, because uh, they have the wisdom to know. Uh, everybody uh, have has their own time. Uh, in time to come, uh, even our Alan also will become an Arahan, maybe some, some Buddha also. <laughs> Just like right now, his time is not here, la. No, not, not, not yet. La. Uh, so, every one of us uh, have our time, don't worry. La.
They will be very alone and they tend to keep to themselves. So I, I was wondering if, if a person is so serious, he will be very anti social and he doesn't um, engage uh, uh, in community or he doesn't get himself engaged in the community. So, how does that behavior? How do we consult that behavior with the uh, in a community like ours? That one, I think, is um, up to the individual. Um, like the Buddha, when he was striving, uh, he um, practiced uh, absolute uh, aloofness uh, from society. Uh. He said uh, he lived like a forest deer. Uh. He lived deep in the in the in the forest. Uh. When he saw anybody coming, uh, he would quickly run away, uh. and then he would uh, sleep in the charnel ground, uh, uh, the cemetery. Uh and use the bones uh, as a pillow and uh, he uh, practice, uh, tried to practice equanimity. Uh. So he said sometimes these, these uh, boys who look after the cows, uh, they come and disturb him. Uh, urinate on him or so, he just ignore. Uh. He doesn't even walk away, uh, just let them do what they want. Uh. They poke his ears or so, he just ignore. Post, poke his nose or so, he just ignore them. Uh. So. Uh, and um, at other times, uh, he he would just avoid any anybody. Uh, and uh, but when he was enlightened, uh, then he came out and taught taught the Dhamma to the whole world. So uh, there are some people, on the other hand, uh, when they are practicing, also uh, they feel uh, that there is a need uh, to do something for society. So they come and do. But if on the when they are striving for uh, on the spiritual path, uh, if they, uh, for example, like teach the Dhamma and all that, uh, then they uh, cannot go as fast as 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 possible. Uh, then they because they sacrifice uh, their time uh, for others. Uh, uh, so each person is different. No? Each person is different. Uh, there are some people they they strive very hard, and after they become enlightened, also they just go. D- just go into a deep forest and die in the forest. And then the character is like that. Now each person has a different character. You cannot uh, cannot uh, say anything about them. No? Okay, maybe we end here.